December 2019. We start hearing rumors an outbreak of atypical pneumonia occurring in China. Singapore has confirmed 10 new cases. 74 new cases. 65 new cases. 287 new cases. We quickly realized that it was just the tip of the iceberg. The only way for us to prevent being overwhelmed was to force a break in transmissions. We will therefore impose significantly stricter measures. This is like a circuit breaker. We were hoping that vaccines would end the pandemic. Finally, we have light at the Alma Tanner. I wasn't sure if I ought to be there. <laughs> In my enthusiasm, when the first batch arrived, I self-invited myself. <laughs> I was wearing my hat as Transport Minister. We wanted to tell the world that we can be a regional hub for transporting vaccines. This is life-saving. It is uh, potentially the start of the end. Very, very early in 2020, I started to talk to my friends overseas just to understand how vaccine development was proceeding towards the end of the first quarter into the second quarter. Separate teams started to look at the vaccine candidates and frontrunners and start to look at the ones that they could potentially invest in. Then in April or May, companies like Moderna started reporting the animal studies and their phase one human trials. And the data looked quite promising. A more compressed timeline was necessary. And that meant that we had to examine long-held notions, essentially, about how you do evaluations safely without compromising the safety and the quality of information that you want to get out of it. For a first in the world, like a novel vaccine that has not been approved by any country or any regulatory agency, we typically have a process called a full evaluation that takes about 13 months to approve. In a pandemic, we have to switch gear from, you know, business as usual to emergency response. But the scientific part is something that we will never compromise. It will be there no matter how compressed the timeline would be. I think my whole team probably didn't sleep for two weeks. As Pomtech Health, I signed all the advanced purchase agreement. And I remember when I, when I look at it, I look at the deposits we have to pay, which is non-refundable, <laughs> whether it works or not. Uh, we, are, we were putting quite a lot of money into betting on these different areas. I'm very happy to tell you that after studying the scientific evidence and clinical trial data, the Health Sciences Authority, HSA, has approved the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine for pandemic use. When I saw the news, I just felt, yeah, finally, we did it. <laughs> yeah. to make sure that our logistics was in place. We had to procure our cold storage facilities even before there was a global shortfall towards the end of 2020. The challenge is that these vaccines are kept at minus 80 degrees Celsius. No one actually had the experience when it comes to scale. Every time the door is opened and you remove a tray and you close the door back, even if it's momentary, the temperature increases. We realised, hey, you cannot open the freezer too often. So we did a lot of trials and moving forward from there, we moved very cautiously to make sure that we built enough competency and freezers to keep the rest of the vaccines coming. We focused on making sure we had the delivery capability to reach out. First, we needed vaccine centres that can provide high throughput. Centres all around Singapore, well spread out. And very happily, different agencies offered their sites. One of my staff mentioned to me that because of the restrictions in flights, Terminal 4 was completely closed and sealed. So maybe we should consider Terminal 4. I needed to write to the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Transport. And within three hours, I remember very clearly, he approved it. And at that point in time, he asked, you know, so do you want Terminal 2 as well? Next, we need to have manpower to do it. And we couldn't use the public manpower because they were all involved in the hospitals fighting COVID. MOH approached us because we're the incumbent uh, medical provider for the airport. 
Within five days, we had to operate at the vaccination center. We needed to get in enough nurses and train up enough vaccinators to be able to handle the throughput of 4,000 vaccines a day. All of us spent the whole night at the vaccination center looking at the whole place being built up, all the partitions being built up. Vaccinations changed the entire equation. We decided that the first priority was to start things going with healthcare workers and those who are working in essential services. First group of people that were vaccinated were healthcare workers at NCID. In order for me to tell you that you should go for vaccination, then I should go for it. This program allowed us to go through in detail the work processes on how vaccines should be delivered, how do we dilute, how do we put it into five doses, six doses in one vial, and the whole process being mapped out in NCID as a pilot project and subsequently scaled up in many of the vaccination centres. Once we were comfortable that we had got that underway, we started opening vaccination to the next group of people that we were most concerned about. And those were those uh, that uh, were highly at risk of getting very bad infections, the vulnerable people. So that would be seniors. We looked at those who had other medical conditions that would make their immune system weaker. They were also our priority. We had to move the vaccination centre to the nursing homes and mobile vaccination teams allowed us to do that. But beyond that, we noticed that there were pockets of elderly. They were not staying in nursing homes, but they were staying by themselves. But their ability to move around is very much limited. The civil generation officer, they will go to the door and knock and explain to them, all the mobile vaccination team comes with the doctor. The elderly tends to have the three highs, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high sugar, you know, they tend to worry about this vaccination will affect them, you see. You'll see a lot of elderly come with their big swallows or medications. They'll put the medications on the table and then they'll ask the doctor to go through to advise them whether these medications have any interactions with the vaccines. I have these SGOs that have so good relationship with his residents that when the day of vaccination, right, the resident actually asked, is this SGO so and so here? I want him to accompany me through the journey. So he stopped his lunch and accompanied her for the vaccination. I also saw very heartwarming scenes where these were grassroots people. They knew where all the people were. They knew where their friends were. They knew who were the ones who were less mobile. They even knew who hadn't taken their vaccines yet. We were able to tap on them and they would go around and bring these people down to the mobile teams. No time in history has a vaccine been within such a short period of time developed and rolled out. We want to try to ensure that as many Singaporeans' lives are protected as possible. That's like at the Alma Tunnel. treated as liquid gold and the team was energized by a very simple slogan that says that every vaccination administered is a life saved. We were rushing to vaccinate as fast as we could. We put the plan in place. As fast as a shipment comes in, we push it out, we give people a jam and we just have a very aggressive uh, vaccination campaign. Somewhere in June, we were administering a very large number of doses per day, I think about 60,000 or so which means that therefore there was hardly anything in my storehouses. We only had a couple of days worth of vaccines left. We were tracking the vaccines from the time it left the factory to the time it boarded the aircraft all the way till it landed in Singapore. My staff were, you know, they were biting their nails. And once that million doses landed in Singapore, we all breathed a sigh of relief. We said the eagle has landed. You know, it's almost as if it was a lunar landing of uh, the Americans in 1969. We were also targeting to have 70% of the population vaccinated by National Day because herd immunity for some diseases, when you get about 70% or so people vaccinated, you can achieve herd immunity. 
but our original assumption that the vaccine would be the silver bullet didn't quite pan out. The moment that I stepped in, Delta wave started. I came in middle of May. Within two weeks, I have to deliver a speech to the whole healthcare community, the leadership. We being MOH, we have to make the decision that will make us carry the most burden. I didn't put it in those words, but that was essentially the message that we need to live with COVID, but it will be a tough journey. MOH will disproportionately bear the burden. Are we prepared to do it? Our concern presently are the clusters in the Bukit Merah and Tiong Bahru area. We saw tens of cases a day. And even though we managed to bring that under control, we had subsequent outbreaks and subsequent clusters in July, August of 2021. 16 COVID-19 cases in the community, the highest in more than nine months. Eight are linked to a nurse who works at Tantok Singh Hospital. Singapore's KTV COVID-19 cluster has grown to 53 cases. The Jurong Fishery Port is the country's largest active cluster with more than 300 cases. There has been spread from the Jurong Fishery Port to Hong Lim Market. We did not expect the virus to evolve in such a rapid speed because when we look at the viral quantity of virus and we compare with the ancestral strain, it was so much higher, 100 times, 1,000 times higher than the original virus. So we stepped up our contact tracing, our case finding and our containment measures. Delta wave was the one where we did the most number of PCR tests. At the peak, one day we did 64,000 swabs. SCF also came in to support in one or two operations. So altogether, we were able to do up to about 70,000 swaps a day. And for a while, we actually managed to control those clusters for about two months. But thereafter, because there were a lot more arrivals, imported cases from overseas that seeded infections, numbers started to rise very quickly. Very, very tough time because there were so many of them. As you dealt with one, we find that another one has come out. I did have a feeling that it was a bit like whack-a-mole. Currently, we are almost at the 1,600 cases. And if the trend continues, the number of cases is likely to double to 3,200 a day by next week. It was extremely stressful. It hit you like a, like a one-two punch. If you look around the world, the fatality rates were in the first year anywhere from 0.2% to about 2 or in some countries even 10%. And you can imagine in Singapore's case, if we had even 2% fatalities, it would mean about 100,000 deaths. Hospitals were extremely busy, but we did not reach a stage where it was overwhelmed. Overwhelmed meaning you can't save lives that need to be saved. That means people come in unable to breathe and you run out of ventilators, for example. People need ICU and you run out of ICU rooms, for example. We had to tighten, and we let go, then we tighten. It was extremely frustrating, uh, understandably so, but we did that purely to protect the healthcare system. This was actually a strategy coined by Thomas Puyo, and he termed it the hammer and dance approach. We took the hammer approach, prevent things from getting out of control, brought cases down to a much lower level, and subsequently, we danced to the tune of the virus. And in any dance, you would take a step forward, maybe a step back. The whole idea is that you do not want to remain closed for a long period of time. So we knew we had to open up, but we didn't want to open up so wide that we risk getting it out of control and we have to bring up the hammer again. We didn't want to go to another circuit breaker. I don't think anyone wanted that. We need to protect our hospitals and patients. If the cases keep on rising, it can come under significant pressure. Hence, after thinking long and hard, we decided we have to revert to phase two heightened alert. 
there were about 50 patients waiting in the queue to be seen by a doctor, which is very high uh, by normal standards. In a normal shift, you mainly only have about three to four admissions. Overnight, in one of the wards, there were 16 admissions, and the other ward had 18 admissions. That's really mind-boggling. And our rosters were constantly being rejected. There were many versions of rosters floating around. There were drawer plans of drawer plans. So I still recall in NCID, we had to increase our ICU capacity in terms of having some of the negative pressure isolation ward to upgrade it into mini ICU, put in ventilators, put in more of the measurement gadgets so that we can measure the oxygen content of the patients. And we even plan to have at least half of the NCID become an intensive care uh, facilities. So you can imagine the kind of pressure that Delta put onto the entire system. So the only way we could do this was to shut down some of our non-essential services so that this stuff can be diverted to emergency department, the fever wards, the isolation wards, to help bolster the front line. Staff who were normally not involved in patient-fronting duties, administrators, HR, finance folk, were volunteering to work alongside the staff in the wards to take care of simple duties like serving meals, so I'm from radiology, but we also had to deal with uh, growing workload, limited manpower, mental stress, people on medical leave or on quarantine because of exposure. And this added to an overall strain for all the healthcare teams. The biggest stresses uh, was finding enough people to do all the jobs that were required, both for the day-to-day, -day, the, the business as usual, as well as the uh, COVID-related surges. The Health Ministry says COVID-19 isolation beds are 85% full despite efforts to set aside more capacity. So while we had provision for up to 500 in ICU, 350 put the ICU uh, team under significant stress. You will result in integrated care once you go beyond your normal ICU walls. At the peak, we were providing 260 beds. So it was a very big operation on our part to be able to do that and to be able to have the personnel to do it for a prolonged period of time. The numbers were growing and they were getting quite exhausted. The constant fear of the staff safety, whether we'll start a cluster in the hospital. But they are quite gung-ho as well, you know. <laughs> We have people who are a bit older and, and still want to be in the ward helping, and we have nurses who are not from their ward, you know, volunteering to help with the COVID um, patients. We do know by that time that if we are able to get access to good care, ICU ventilators, we're able to tide you over the most difficult period. And so the access was probably the most important thing in the healthcare system. So we were determined to ensure that that was uh, made available by building up a whole series of facilities. Around 70 patients have been admitted into Singapore's first community treatment facility as efforts to ease the strain on the country's hospitals continue. These are facilities meant for patients that are infected with COVID, but otherwise generally well. But this group don't need to be in the hospital. From the acquiring of the site to the design, construction, training the people, getting the people in, it took less than a month. Within months, we have sufficient capacity to make sure our hospitals are not overwhelmed. We had to ramp up to become a CTF because of the Delta wave. The workload was tremendous because when the patients started coming in, they actually doubled every two to three days. What happened during that wave was uh, all my managers came every day. We, we started early at 8 a.m., we ended usually past 10 p.m. Um, I had staff that were coming down with COVID as well. So many other staff needed to step out to do overtime to actually take on the load of the other staff. All of us went into the red zone. There was no, you are the boss, I'm the boss. I don't need to do all this. I, the managers help to feed the patients, help to change the diapers. On top of looking after the patients, if there was a need to help out the others, the doctors, they also go in and change the diapers. 
Daily we have uh, nurses and uh, staff coming to us in tears to share how tired they are because of the workload. For me as a leader, I had to balance uh, the needs of my staff as well as the national needs because I was involved in uh, the national meetings every day. I knew how stretched our system was as well. We were being assailed on multiple fronts, having to ban call centres to advise people what to do, having to work with the hospitals to move people to CTFs, make sure they have enough people to work their emergency departments, also have people to keep the clusters under control. And I think those three months were probably the hardest that we had during this campaign. For the team, the kind of work hours they put in, the kind of effort they put in, at the risk of their own personal health. I would say that the fatigue was very real. But just like the pandemic, this is not a training exercise. The virus is also very real. We asked for help from other agencies, uh, from the wider public service to help us, as well as from the SAF and Home Team, who were coming in to reinforce our ranks. We were doing very intense, very complete contact tracing for every single case but we realised that we couldn't contain it anymore because we didn't have the capacity, the number of contact tracers, the number of public health officers and investigators to do that forever. So we had to change our strategy. There's no reason why we cannot live with COVID-19. It is an additional risk that we have to bear in life, but it should not be a risk that leads us to paralysing our whole economy and society. With vaccinations, COVID has become a treatable, mild disease. That's why we are shifting to relying heavily on home recovery. 